okay? This is where I do most of my writing, actually, just in this little, <laughs> this little office. It's unusually neat right now. And I have various sort of historical artifacts from various parts of my life. Any historian will be very happy when people say, your history helps me understand the present, because ultimately that's really what we're trying to do. My father was a historian. My uncle, Philip Foner, was a historian. I grew up in a family where there was a lot of just informal discussion of history at the dinner table and things like that. And moreover, this was the early 1960s. The country was going through a tremendous crisis, the civil rights revolution. The kind of history we've been taught, let's say in high school, could not explain what was happening in the country, which means it wasn't very good history. We were taught that all the problems had been solved, just a few little administrative tweaks were needed, and suddenly there were millions of people demanding their rights in the streets. Where did that come from? I was getting a different history at home than I was getting in school, which was a kind of interesting experience. My father was blacklisted the whole time I was growing up. He was among a fairly large group of teachers at the City University of New York who lost their jobs because of a legislative investigation of supposedly subversive communist elements in the City University teaching ranks. The communist war to destroy our nation. One of the charges against my father by an informant was that he spent too much time on black history. That showed that he wasn't really a very patriotic American. The 60s, when I was an undergraduate and then graduate student, was a pretty volatile time, and I certainly took part in the civil rights revolution going on. I just got involved in whatever was happening on campus, which at Columbia culminated in the student occupation of buildings in 1968. We have taken the power away from an irresponsible and illegitimate administration but mostly civil rights issues. Those are the kind of things that were most meaningful to me. It's ironic that I did a lot of the research on my book on Reconstruction in what was called the Burgess Library. Burgess, John Burgess was the founder of political science at Columbia, but deeply, deeply racist and wrote horrendous things about Reconstruction and the lack of civilization of black people and things like that. For many, many years, Reconstruction was seen as the lowest point in the history of the United States. But the reason supposedly was that African Americans were given the right to vote and take part in government, and they were just incapable of doing that. This is a view of history with direct relevance to the present. And a whole generation of younger historians like myself began to rethink that history. Well, I decided early on I wanted to write this book from the grassroots up. The struggles of former slaves, former slave owners, Klansmen, victims of the Klan, the day-to-day -day experience of Reconstruction, that was something I wanted to write about, but that meant I had to really dig into an immense amount of archival material. Although when I wrote that book there was no internet. No, I had to go out and do the research in the archives, in the libraries. People are better positioned to address the present if they have an idea where we came from, how we got here. There's no direct link between what happened in Reconstruction and what happened today, but the issues are still there. The Civil Rights Movement was often called the second Reconstruction, the second time that the country sort of tried to come to grips with the consequences of the end of slavery. And I think we may be heading toward, I hope we are, a third Reconstruction, where some of these issues that have been agitated all this year are really addressed. It wouldn't have been surprising if someone had told me at the beginning of this year, well, a black man is going to be killed by the police and there will be demonstrations. Well, yeah, that happened many a time, sadly. And then they dissipate. It would have been very surprising if someone had said, but they won't dissipate. It will, it will continue. I'm tremendously impressed and inspired with what has happened this year in terms of people of all races, creeds, and ages demonstrating, but particularly the young, both black and white and others, taking to the streets over and over again in sustained demands for real substantive change in this country.
Yeah, it does remind me of the 1960s in many ways. One theme that seems to run through all my body of work is the whole question of freedom. We are the land of the free in the United States, at least that's what we tell ourselves, but freedom doesn't mean the same thing to each group of people. White Americans, by and large, think that freedom is something they have and somebody is trying to take away from them. African Americans think that freedom is something they are striving to achieve and haven't quite gotten there yet. No book in history, this is a sad fate we all have to suffer, no book on history is the final word. This is what I'm most proud of down here, actually. One, two, three, four shelves of books by former students of mine. Our fate is always to be superseded by some younger historian who comes along. They've all made a big mark on the study of American history um, over the years.